Alrighty, folks. Yesterday, Mercenaries, the new game mode for Hearthstone, was revealed to some confusion and consternation, to be sure. Uh, but I want to start breaking down the different components of Mercenaries in a little bit more detail. If you didn't understand exactly what was going on, hopefully this particular video will help you make more sense of the combat, both from an overview level, but also getting into some of the nuts and bolts and even potential strategies that you might encounter in Mercenaries combat. Now, I want to be clear, I haven't played this. This is all based on the footage that Blizzard provided as a part of the press experience, which we're going to be watching in this video and the details that have been provided across the various blog posts and showcases so far, which I do think ultimately provide a pretty good picture of what exactly this is going to be. So essentially throughout this video, I'll be running through some of the footage that we got from Blizzard and pausing it, breaking down various components and talking through it. Hopefully that's a helpful way to do this. I, you know, I'm not used to having to present these sorts of things or explain these sorts of things. So uh, bear with me if this isn't the perfect presentation. That said, what you see behind me right here is the Mercenaries game board. Uh, so it's going to look like when you're actually in the combat phase. And it's really pretty simple. You're going to have units on your side facing off against enemy units. Generally, that's going to be 3v3. This is a tutorial version, so there's just 2v2 right now. And now, the interesting thing and big difference in normal Hearthstone is there's no deck. There's no cards. You're going to have essentially minions on the board that each have their own distinct abilities they use and you're going to stick with these minions throughout the course of a run and we'll talk about what a run means a little more later in the video so when you start a mercenaries combat basically you're going to select one of your minions as you see here click to choose this merc they have attack and health values like normal minions once you do you're going to see this pop up in the middle where you choose an ability for this mercenary each mercenary is going to have three abilities. Some additional ones can be added in based on certain conditions throughout a run. Basically, you can get extra treasure abilities and such. Uh, but you're going to prepare the ability, which essentially means uh, this is the ability this character is going to utilize this turn. In this particular case, the ability here for Cariel is Crusader's Blow, which will attack an enemy using her three attack value. And then there's a keyword here, Death Blow. If she kills the enemy with this ability, She'll also restore 10 health to this mercenary. It's a holy type, which all of that will matter as we go through this. Uh, so you can see here, she's queuing up the ability, then selecting the target. Then you'll move on to your next mercenary. You'll select them. You'll queue up their ability. Currently, there's only one because, again, this is the tutorial. That's dealing four damage. You select your target. So once you've selected your abilities, you'll hit ready. And... Uh, once this <laughs> tutorial catches up, you can read here, you, Mercs use their prepared abilities automatically in combat, destroy all the enemies to win. So uh, it's just going to auto resolve. Your opponents are going to do their abilities and you're going to do your abilities. The order of those abilities will be determined by a speed value, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I know it sounds confusing yet again, but we'll we'll get there, I promise. Here's a little tip, attack type abilities do physical combat with the enemy. Be careful as you'll take return damage in the process, much like when you're trading uh, with normal Hearthstone abilities. Other abilities can be safely used from range and abilities that are attack type will say attack the other enemy. It's not, if it's not specified, it is a ranged ability. It just says deal four damage, for instance. So here, attack an enemy in this case. So this combat's going to resolve. Uh, you'll see she'll restore some health when she kills this rat off of her death blow. Boom, she heals back to full. That's awesome. No damage taken on the return because that was a ranged ability. The fight is won. We killed all the enemies. So moving on to the next important aspect here is speed of abilities. You might be wondering like, what's the mana cost? Well, there is no mana cost. There's a speed value indicated with these little wing icons on abilities and the lower the number the faster the ability so if you have a speed of one your ability is going to probably resolve very quickly other abilities might have a five or even i think i've seen up to like an 11 speed 
And that matters when combat's resolving automatically, because what can happen is if your ability's faster and you kill the opposing unit before their ability goes off because it was slower, then obviously that's gonna offer you a huge advantage in combat. And if there is a tie between speed values, so the opponent uses a five and you use a five, those are going to be a coin flip essentially, or if there's multiple fives, of course, just randomly determined the uh, proc order. Now, if two enemies use a five and one ally uses a five, I don't know if there is any sort of alternate speed kind of uh, controls built in. In other words, like, can the enemies get both fives to go off before an allied gets a five to go off if there's three fives in the pool? That's unclear. I'm sure we'll see that or get details on that in the future. I certainly hope uh, there's some controls there in the randomness that it alternates uh, when necessary if there are multiple fives uh, in a combat. So you can see here the speed is six for Crusader's Blow. Uh, based on what I've seen, it seems to be about one to 10 on average. Like I said, there are some 11s, but uh, it seems like there's kind of some really quick, low powered early game stuff, some mid game stuff and some late game stuff or late turn stuff in this particular scenario. It seems like a lot of things from like four to six range though, three to seven maybe. But as you get like, it, it feels like mana costs in Hearthstone, honestly, like eight drops are like really big and slow and are definitely gonna be last in most combats, it seems, right? So here we're just seeing, uh, you know, selecting units and oh, these are the indicators for when units are going to attack. So because she selected a lower speed ability, she's going first and Cariel is going second. So we'll see that resolve in this combat. Once you hit in turn, they're gonna automatically do their thing. That's a five, so it goes up first. That's a six. Boom, boom, boom. That's an eight, so it's going off last, and that's an eight randomly determined going off last again. So uh, interestingly, speed values have a lot of uh, implications for strategy, of course, because you often will want to play things before your opponent, dealing damage to secure those lethal blows, maybe just getting a clutch heal off before your opponent is about to kill one of your units, and that has a big determinant here. Uh, on how combats are going to resolve and probably indicates a lot of the strategic depth that is possible in mercenary combats. Now of note and of importance is when you're in a PVP game mode, which is being uh, represented here in this tutorial where you're fighting against computer opponents, you will be able to hover over their characters and see what their ability will be. So of course that allows you to sort of counterplay and like, oh, I need to get in before this ability. When you're in the PVP system that exists for mercenaries, you will not be able to see uh, what your opponent's abilities are. So you're gonna have to take some guesses based on metas and what you understand about the characters. You won't know what they have queued up. So there's gonna be some kind of like, ooh, are they gonna use their seven man ability or their five man ability? And you maybe have to make some tough decisions based on that, which again, uh, allows for a lot of strategy and counterplay potential, I think, in uh, PvP aspects. So here we sit on the victory screen for a while, <laughs> really savoring this victory. And all right, here's another important part of Mercenaries Combat. This is uh, bonus damage. Basically, we've got uh, Pokemon stuff happening across the board here. So uh, there are three different colors of characters in Mercenaries, red, green, and blue. And if you happen to be colorblind and have trouble telling the difference between uh, these three, you'll note there's also iconography around their attack symbols to indicate what they are as well. So fighters who are green also have a sword. Protectors who are red have kind of like a little shield thing going on around their attack icon. And casters who are blue uh, have a little wand icon essentially. And you'll need to remember this wheel of damage, of course, uh, to maximize opportunities. You want your protectors attacking the enemy fighters and so on, and uh, do note that the damage dealt is not just based on attack abilities, but all abilities. So ranged abilities and attacks both deal double damage uh, when possible to opponents. You'll also see some iconography here. There's a little bit of a glow at the bottom of the character to indicate that that 2x damage is happening. Apparently also a 2x pops up. I don't know if that's in the tutorial or in general. I've seen just the glow in other videos, so who knows? But uh, you'll see here, uh, the extra damage happening, combat resolving. So we've got blue hitting uh, green, and uh, that's normal damage. We've got uh, blue hitting red, that's extra damage. So Cariel took, uh, let's let's slow this down here, man. It's fast when we need it to be slow and slow when we need it to be fast. 
She dealt two from blinding luminance to green. That's normal damage, so he takes two. Now, on the other hand, the Murloc here is blue, a caster, which is really good against protectors. So this two damage it's supposed to deal actually dealt four to Cariel. Got the critical hit. Similarly, uh, the protector here hitting the uh, fighter dealt six damage, even though her attack is three because it got doubled. So on and so forth. So just memorize the colors and that'll certainly have a big uh, impact on how you attack and so on. You may not always want to proc critical attacks if you can still get like a finishing blow or something. There may sometimes be value in attacking just the right target as opposed to one that's dealing double damage, but certainly uh, any opportunities you can just squeeze in double damage. There's no reason not to take it. And that'll also have big implications about how you assemble your team and the characters that you utilize, which I think we'll probably talk about a little more later when we talk about the overarching run system of mercenaries. In fact, I think we're going to talk about it right here a little bit. So this is the bench and uh, sort of combat system of mercenaries. Essentially, when you go into a run for mercenaries, you'll select six of the mercenaries that you want to use. Of course, you could go all red if you want, if they have certain synergies, but you might want to take like two of each, for instance, two protectors, two fighters and two casters. And uh, when you enter into a specific combat, what you're going to do is select the three mercenaries that you want to use for that combat. The rest will be on your bench. And the bench is important because if a mercenary dies in combat, you'll be able to take one off of your bench and replace the mercenary in combat. Also important what's happening right now, you'll note, is that you can select positioning for mercenaries when you play them down, which does have very important implications. A lot of abilities are positioning based. So there's like Meteor, for instance. So higher health minions in the middle might be susceptible to Meteor uh, and a variety of other things as well. Uh, based on positional advantages so that matters and when you get a mercenary off the bench you'll also be able to place that mercenary i'm told in the position that you desire so you could maybe put it in the middle to the left or to the right of course and kind of move people around based on that so here we see some more combat resolving based on all the things we know we had one die so guess what replace defeated mercenaries with ones from your bench defeated mercenaries will not be able to fight for the rest of the map and a map here is basically a run so you do want to protect your mercenaries because they don't come back outside of some special conditions and map uh, or run uh, features where you can bring them back to life, which, again, we might talk about a little later. So here we have just more combat being resolved. It goes pretty quick, as you can see, when you kind of know what's going on, as the person here playing seems to, seems to know. And boom, boom, boom. Attacks resolving. Death blow gains some attack. So on and so forth. That was the uh, tutorial component we were uh, provided uh, with the Blizzard footage. So I wanted to go through that. Now, this is an actual just like full combat round. And I wanted to, to some extent, go through this and just, you know, identify the highlights and talk about interesting things that we see along the way. Little strategic decisions, uh, important points of note so we can kind of glean from this and obviously again i haven't played so i'm not going to note everything i'll miss some important elements but i think it'll be helpful for us to just talk through this and kind of say like oh okay i see so for instance right off the bat we see that three of the characters we're fighting all three of them are protectors they're red they have the little shield icons if you're having some problems with color blindness color coded gameplay is certainly not uh Always uh, helpful for that, but we got the shields too, so they're red. That means uh, we're going to be very well positioned with blue characters dealing additional damage to red characters, our casters beating these protectors. As you can kind of see below me, even though the video stuff's covering it up, we have two casters in hand. So we might want to put both of those in initially. I don't know what this person's going to do. I haven't watched this yet, but uh, we'll see. Oh, also, hovering over our opponents, we can see some passive effects here. Demons are immune to shadow damage. Demons have plus 10 holy weakness. So it seems like Zyrella, if she has some holy stuff, might be absolutely bonkers. Whereas any character who's using shadow uh, won't be great here, and they're not going to deal a ton of damage to all these various demons because Lord Bane Hollow is obviously a demon with a ton of health, by the way. I guess uh, these other guys don't have much stats wise. They're just kind of doing their thing. Uh, we saw Cariel coming in. She had a passive effect as well, which I don't know what it was. Zyrella coming in. You can see the stats here are much larger because these characters have been leveled up to 30. 
Uh, we'll talk more about progression and leveling in a future video, but essentially your mercenaries will get stronger over time in your collection, leveling from 1 to 30 and gaining a ton of stats in the process. Uh, we see these gaps in the character uh, box here, the text box. I don't know if these are uh, where like certain like treasures might be equipped with extra passives. We saw that Cariel had a passive. I, I obviously don't know if this is from some sort of treasure or uh you know part of the character's natural progression i don't know those details yet but something to note anyway some seem to have effects and others do not all of which can have a big impact on the course of a game so we're putting in uh two casters right off the bat as we said blues are good against red makes sense try to utilize these advantages as soon as we can we see we have two fighters and one protector on the bench cariel comes up she's deciding uh what attack she's going to do by looking at the demonic tyrant's effect Currently, it looks like he's going second as far as what we know. There's another character over here that'll be going first. Uh, he's selecting a 10 speed ability, Shadow Rin 2, deal 20 damage to the enemy with the highest health. So currently, that would certainly be to Cariel. She's expecting to take 20. She's going to use, I guess, a... Oh, we didn't talk about cooldowns. Oh, here we go. We have ability with a cooldown. This one takes a little while to come into action. You can't use it on your first turn. And presumably after you use it, it'll have another downturn of time. These are particularly powerful abilities that for one reason or another have some gating to how quickly you can use them. Uh, we're also hovering over the other demonic tyrant. It's using a four speed, so it's definitely going to go before the other. It attacks an enemy. If your party has another demon, deal five to a random enemy. So he's going to deal he's going to deal nine from his attack and an additional bonus five. And then uh, we've got the main guy here using something which I guess they didn't hover yet or I missed it. Uh, Cariel queued up in abilities. Irela is queuing up Blinding Luminance, which is uh, dealing 13 to an enemy and giving it negative 10 attacks. So some, some big damage output and a nice little debuff bundled in there as well. That's pretty sweet. She's going to use that over here because this guy was attacking, remember? So he's going to get that attack debuff and deal way less damage. Important to note. Uh, Millhouse here is using... Uh, Arcane Bolt dealing 12 damage and gaining three arcane damage, presumably for future effects. We also see here that Millhouse has a fourth ability queued up. This to me seems to be some sort of treasure collected throughout the course of a run. I don't know the full details though. So Millhouse is going right to the dome of the main boss there. We're gonna see this combat resolve. Now uh, note how much damage that dealt. <laughs> Uh, it dealt 46. Can we break down why it dealt 46? Uh, that's basically, uh, the 13 getting doubled, uh, was 26 plus, I guess the additional, uh, 10 damage taken from Holy, uh, also perhaps being doubled for another 20 to deal, uh, 46 damage, I think is how that's being calculated, but please feel free to correct me if that's not sounding right to your ears so uh the rest of these are going off uh again 24 damage here being doubled so big hits of course oh but look we saw an interesting thing happen right we saw an interesting thing happen we had an ability that was supposed to deal 20 damage to the enemy with the highest health at the start of combat that was cariel but because cariel took damage along the way that shifted over to being xyrella so here again, we can kind of see how attacks resolving and order resolving matters a lot because essentially instead of our tank, our protector taking the damage, instead our really valuable holy caster took the damage instead. So you might have to play around and consider these sort of uh, of uh, turn orders and, and health. You know, there's basically a lot of conditions happening that can change what happens throughout the course of a combat really easily. Here we're seeing again... Uh, I guess that was maybe Lord Bane Hollow's effect, the deal 20. Maybe that's who was doing it earlier. Gain three shadow damage. Enemies can't heal this turn. Okay, that's pretty cool. That's a cooldown ability. Might be important because I believe we have some healing stuff. Restore 40 health to this Merc with a death blow. Yep. Oh, she had a fourth ability too. Atonement here is what we're going to use, I guess, for nine speed. Deal 15 damage plus three damage each time your party restores 10 health. Okay, so that scales over the course of a fight. That's pretty cool. Maybe she's actually just going to use Blinding Luminance again, I guess. Yep. 
All right, greater arcane missiles shoot three missiles that deal 13 damage each. That's going to be huge with all the doubled damage here. That's basically going to be able to secure some lethal blows, I think, if it if it wants to. So, I mean, a lot of things are happening, right? Because remember, when you're attacking, you're taking damage on defense. So you kind of have to calculate like, okay, this guy's going to attack. He's going to attack Kariel. He's going to take 14. Do I want to use my like, you know, 60 damage ability to kill this guy or do I want to use it on the 38 for maximizing my uh, efficiency, right? So kind of wasted here, right? Because, oh, well, no, this splits across multiple enemies. So actually not wasted at all. Much like a good arcane missiles, it sniped its target, dealt some good clean damage to the other two as well. So actually pretty perfect. I take it back. So again, we're just going through the... Going through the stuff here, I mean, this is happening pretty fast, right? I think if you're in a in a run, if you don't feel confident in your abilities, you're probably going to be mapping this out a little more closely. Oh, we might see uh, Millhouse's treasure. We didn't, sadly. Uh, but, you know, if your characters are strong enough, because you're going to be kind of dictating the uh, power of your enemies based on the difficulty of the run that you decide to enter into, basically, you can kind of choose what you're gonna fight against. And uh, although it's randomly generated, you're picking the difficulty level and the sorts of targets you might encounter. So you might be able to autopilot essentially if you know the opponent's really weak. Like it seems like what we're fighting here is actually pretty weak for our team. So I, I bet you can kind of just autopilot and click the most basic abilities. And remember, you'll have a ton of familiarity with them as well. So like, oh, ability one does this, ability two does this, just kind of burn through these fights, I'd say rather quickly when the difficulty isn't up to par, but if the difficulty is challenging, you're probably going to have to slow down and really take your time. And in PvP in particular, there's a lot of different implications to consider. So you're probably going to have to take your time a lot for PvP as well. At least as much time is allotted. Okay, so that was a look at uh, combat. And I think a, hopefully a, a pretty detailed one. I think we covered a lot of ground there. I also wanted to note that there are some other aspects of combat that weren't explored especially well there. Uh, there are synergies across uh, unit types. I guess we did see that with demons in that fight, but there's like certain demon synergies, murloc synergies. There are also uh, spell type synergies or ability type synergies like arcane and fire and frost type synergies as well. So that has a lot to do with like team composition and sometimes even how you might execute a turn. There are things like arcane combo where it does something extra. If there was an arcane combo or if there was an arcane ability used previously in the same turn. So even executing a, a single turn can change a lot based on uh, various synergies that exist. There are also some pretty standard looking keywords like taunt, which I'm assuming forces enemies to attack that unit, but assuming the uh, range spells can kind of go beyond the taunt. We've got like divine shield, immune. We saw death blow. I've seen freeze. Uh, there might be others we haven't seen or encountered yet, but a lot of keywords that are probably familiar in some cases, maybe, uh, you know, new and others, but I'm sure aren't too hard to master. All right. So that was combat itself, but I also want to talk about the wrapping around combat, what runs mean, uh, how you get into a run and those sorts of things, because essentially uh, mercenaries is a PVE roguelite. We saw what the combat of that looks like. This is what you would do to start a run. You'll see here behind me on screen. So essentially you have these bounties. Bounties are basically how you kick off a run. So you'll see here there are six to choose from of various levels. You can start with a level four bounty. As you progress through that and beat it, you'll get experience. You'll level up your characters. Again, I'll talk about progression more in a future video, which might mean you can take on the level five bounty. Eventually get up to the level 13 bounty. There are additional uh, levels certainly beyond this. I assume all the way up to level 30. And then there are things like heroic difficulties as well. And uh, I think even modifiers beyond that, I've seen something about a legendary difficulty. So basically you just kind of keep getting tougher and tougher and tougher opponents as you make your team stronger and stronger. So you'll go into a bounty board like this. You'll choose the bounty that you want to, uh, to take on. In this case, you'll see that you're fighting ferocious quill bore as the final boss, which means he's green. Maybe you want to make sure you have some stuff that's good at fighting fighters. So maybe you need some protectors in your, in your team for sure to handle this guy. So then to tackle your bounty, you'll need a party, right? And this is kind of the party creation screen. 
basically just like building a deck in traditional Hearthstone, you'll be able to build a party. You can see here this party is being assembled of King Mukla, King Crush, Rexar, Blink Fox. Maybe it has some beast synergies, it seems, based on the name. And you're going to pick the six mercenaries that you want to take on your journey. You might want to focus on those that are the highest level, maybe the ones that are synergistic. You can see here you can select a caster, fighter, or a protector character. But you want six that are good for this particular bounty based on the little information that you can glean from it or maybe if you've done it before. Once you get into the bounty, it's going to look like this. It's basically a map where you're going to have some choices. So for instance, up first here, you're apparently going to fight off against Varden Dongrasp. And you again learn that Varden is a caster. Doesn't mean everything there is going to be a caster necessarily. But uh, okay, I'm going to fight against Varden, so I'm going to be prepared for that. And then you might have a branching choice. So I want to take on this fighter or this caster, depending on how your team is assembled. And I think there will be other types of encounters as well that aren't necessarily combat based. We've seen a spirit healer, which will uh, be able to bring an opponent or a, a mercenary back to life if they died. Apparently it's a random one. You don't get to choose. But, you know, if you see a spirit healer up the path, you might say, OK, I can take on something more difficult because there are elite encounters, which can be way more challenging, but apparently offer more XP and perhaps tr uh, treasures that you can get along the way to strengthen your team during a run. Treasures are temporary for the run. They're not permanent, uh, you know, adjustments to your mercenaries, but could still help you beat a run that might otherwise be difficult. So you see a spirit healer along the way, you go, okay, cool. I can take on this elite fight. Even if I lose the character, that spirit healer is going to bring them back to life. So you have some decisions essentially about how a uh, given bounty or run is going to unfold. And uh, here we can see the top end of the bounty board run, the map. Uh, you can see here is an elite account encounter, for instance, against Illidan Storm Rage. There was another elite encounter here. I have no idea what this little swirly guy is, but maybe some kind of special encounter uh, that's possible. It might offer a choice like we've seen in many other uh, roguelite style games. And then here's the final boss as well. The big golden one. You beat that. You get your rewards uh, at the end of the journey. You can also view your team there. So. This is uh, what the wrapping of combat looks like. In each one of these nodes, of course, you'll enter those combats that we saw. Now, moving on from the PvE side, there's also a PvP component to mercenaries where you're, uh, you'll head to the fighting pit to fight against other people's teams of mercenaries. Combat's going to look the same, minus the fact that you won't be able to see... Uh, what moves your opponent is locking in is a little bit more guesswork, perhaps based on the meta or, you know, given game states uh, fighting in the uh, fighting pit against the PVP opponents will, will have achievements. You'll get rewards and there's apparently going to be a leaderboard as well. Now of note, uh, in mercenaries, your characters are going to level up. They're going to get stronger across a variety of variables, ability level ups and uh, equipment level ups and level up level ups. So what that means is you might have a level 30 character. Some other guy might have a level five character. Theoretically, you could face off against each other, although it says uh, you're always paired against a similarly powerful team of mercenaries. Now, we don't know what the details of that are, but hopefully PVP is, uh, you know, to some extent fair and symmetrical, although it may still feel like there are moments where it's like, man, he has a level 28 Antonitis and I have a level 27 Antonitis, unlike in standard format where everybody's Antonitis is doing the exact same thing and has the exact same stats as long as you have an Antonitis. So there are certainly some like pay to win aspects and fears inherent to that. Uh, there are many other games that have handled this fairly well, but you may just feel like you can't get to the top of the leaderboard if you haven't either spent the money or spent an inordinate amount of time, depending on how restrictive uh, the experience gains and monetization in this mode is, which so far it seems pretty standard, which is to say pretty punishing, but we don't know all the details yet or how much you unlock for free. So some major concerns there, but final word, you know, we'll wait and see. Uh, where that goes so basically uh, this is you know the reward or how you'll utilize your mercenaries I think to the most extent for most people once you've kind of leveled them up in the PvE experience although I'm sure some people will just be happy to maximize characters in PvE and never actually head to the fighting pit, uh, fighting pit to play against other characters so yeah all that said I, I think that's as much detail as I can give you for what combat in mercenaries gameplay even in mercenaries 
is all about, but I am planning to release future videos discussing the progression system in mercenaries, perhaps even the monetization system in mercenaries for more details on those. I don't expect those videos to be as long, but hopefully still provide some insights. And then also I'd like to do some uh, breakdowns of the characters we've seen so far, probably across each of the roles. So maybe a video on protectors, fighters and casters and the, the uh, various abilities they've, they've showed us so far kind of theorizing theory crafting, what might be good or what feels right. So, Stay tuned for those future Mercenaries videos. And then of course, we'll check out the game mode when it gets released. Uh, to be honest, I have some major hesitations about this one. I have some major concerns about this one, but you know, we'll give it a fair shake and see how it goes. And uh, if it's fun and I think it's monetized fairly enough, maybe we'll play it. Maybe I can recommend it and maybe not. <laughs> Time will have to tell on this one, but hopefully this gave you some more information and insights into whether this is a game mode you think you might enjoy. Please feel free to share all those thoughts in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, game on.